Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I want to thank Greg and uh, Carlos Carvalho, who couldn't be here this evening, the director of the Salem Center uh, at the McCombs School of Business here at UT. Also, Laura McDonald with the LBJ School of Public Affairs has been really wonderful to work with in bringing this debate to you this evening. Um, we really appreciate having this opportunity to collaborate again with the Salem Center. We were here two years ago with a debate on socialism versus capitalism that was uh, very well attended and received many thousands of views on our YouTube channel. So it's, uh, it's great to be back in Austin. We welcome not only our audience here in Austin tonight, but we know we have many more watching the live stream tonight on campuses and in communities all across the country. Tonight's debate will ask an important question, which you can see displayed on the screen here this evening. And those of you watching online are able to vote in this poll also. That question is, what is the best pathway to unlock opportunities for Americans to achieve their dreams? We invite all of our audience members right now here in person, as well as watching the live stream, please answer this poll question with four possible choices. You'll be able to see the uh, numbers change as you vote. You should have received a text with the link to vote. We will also ask your opinion again at the conclusion of the debate to see if we have moved the needle with our debate this evening. But before we begin this evening's debate, I would like to tell you a little bit about Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debate series. Tomorrow evening, we will host another edition of this same debate on the campus of the University of Maryland, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Free tickets for those who are, will be in the College Park area will be available uh, at steamboatinstitute.org, and we will also live stream tomorrow night's debate. You can also watch any of Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates uh, on our YouTube channel. Some of the debates we have hosted in the past include Jason Riley and Donna Brazil debating social justice and identity politics at CU Boulder. We also had Art Laffer and Leslie Marshall debating the wealth tax and higher income tax rates at Middle Tennessee State University. Another of our debates and discussions were professors Alan Dershowitz and Amy Wax discussing campus free speech at Pepperdine, and also Nigel Farage and Vicente Fox debating nationalism versus globalism at the University of Maryland. These are all on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. We're also planning a full schedule of Campus Liberty Tour debates for 2022 on campuses across America. To stay informed, please follow Steamboat Institute on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to get the latest updates, or just go to steamboatinstitute.org and sign up for our email list. Since our founding in 2008 in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, Steamboat Institute has unabashedly promoted five core principles. Those five principles are limited taxation and fiscal responsibility, limited government, free market capitalism, individual rights and responsibilities, and strong national defense. We also unabashedly promote free speech and robust but civilized debate on all issues. Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates are gaining in popularity and importance because of the increasing threat posed by cancel culture. While cancel culture seems to be taking over, Steamboat Institute takes the opposite approach, encouraging free and robust debate on even the most contentious issues. This is how students and all of us develop critical thinking skills and avoid falling into that trap of living in echo chambers. Without this capacity to engage in civilized debate, how can we expect to maintain our representative democracy? As a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute depends on the generous support of many individuals, businesses, and foundations in carrying out our work and bringing you these thought provoking debates. I would like to thank the following major sponsors of our Campus Liberty Tour debates Roger and Sandy Dorf, the Sumners Foundation, the Robert and Judy Newman Family Foundation, Cooper Steele in Nashville the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Anschutz Foundation, the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Snyder Foundation, David and Nell Box from Georgetown, Texas, and Bud and Kay Isaacs from Denver. 
I would also like to thank our media partner, Media DC, which publishes the Washington Examiner, and Ross Kaminsky, host of the Ross Kaminsky Show on KOA Radio and iHeartMedia, for helping to promote this week's debates. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our debaters and moderator for this evening. If I could ask them to come on out on the stage, and I will uh, properly introduce them. Welcome. We'll start on the end with uh, Charles Payne. Charles is host of Making Money with Charles Payne, which you can see weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on Fox Business Network. Charles is also a contributor to the Fox News Channel, frequently appearing on shows such as Your World with Neil Cavuto and Fox and Friends. Charles began his career on Wall Street as an analyst at E.F. Hutton in 1985. In 1991, he founded Wall Street Strategies, an independent stock market research firm where he serves as CEO and principal analyst. Charles published his first book entitled Be Smart, Act Fast, Get Rich in May 2007, and his latest book is Unstoppable Prosperity. Charles attended Minot State College and Central Texas College during his time in the United States Air Force. It's a pleasure to welcome Charles here to UT Austin tonight. Bakari Sellers made history in 2006 when, at just 22 years old, he defeated a 26-year incumbent state representative to become the youngest member of the South Carolina State Legislature and the youngest African-American elected official in the nation. Earning his undergraduate degree from Morehouse College and his law degree from the University of South Carolina, Bakari has championed progressive policies to address issues ranging from education and poverty to preventing domestic violence and childhood obesity. Bakari served on President Barack Obama's South Carolina Steering Committee during the 2008 election. He was named to Time Magazine's 40 Under 40 in 2010 and was named to the Route 100 list of the nation's most influential African Americans for 2014 and 2015. Bakari's first book, My Vanishing Country, is a New York Times bestseller. Bakari practices law with the Strom Law Firm in Columbia, South Carolina, and is a political commentator at CNN. Let's give a warm welcome to Bakari Sellers. And finally, our moderator for this evening is Carrie Sheffield. Carrie is a columnist and broadcaster in Washington, D.C., and is a senior policy analyst at Independent Women's Forum. Earlier this year, Carrie was awarded the Tony Blankley Fellowship for Public Policy and American Exceptionalism, a fellowship which is awarded annually by the Steamboat Institute to support and encourage the work of principled young journalists and conservative thought leaders. Carrie previously worked at both Moody's Investors Service in Manhattan and Goldman Sachs. She has been published and featured in The Hill, Politico, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and other publications. Carrie earned a master's in public policy from Harvard, concentrating in business policy. She has a BA in communications from Brigham Young University, and she completed a Fulbright Fellowship in Berlin. So let's give a warm welcome to Carrie and all of our panelists. And once again, Please vote in the poll if you've not already. We're going to take this graphic down in just a minute, and then we will re-poll at the end. So I'll turn it over to our moderator. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good to be here, UT Austin. Hook them. We're here. You're hooked. You're hooked for the evening with these two great gentlemen. Uh, so glad to have you both here. And we are going to give you a chance to vote on the same question to see the delta. How much was of a, a change was there between what these gentlemen said? How did they sway you? That's what we're really looking for. How persuasive are they? <laughs> so uh, we're going to take the same vote afterward. Uh, so to start things off, I'm going to give each of these two gentlemen a chance to give three minutes of opening remarks. I'm going to do a Q&A with them for 30 minutes, 
And then you all are going to be part of the show. Uh, we're going to have 30 minutes where you all can participate. You should have on your program a QR code. Uh, since we all know about the menu situation, you should know how to use a QR code. If not, I can't help you. <laughs> Ask your neighbor uh, or borrow your neighbor's program and make sure to type your question in. I will only pick the best one, so make it good. And we will throw them over and give them a chance to respond to each other. I do have to say one thing I love about the Steamboat Institute and why I'm, I'm proud to be a fellow is that we are all about elevating the conversation in America. I, I, I know I speak for lots of people and probably most of you in this room uh, where we are sick and tired of the animosity and, and the anger and the yelling. So we're going to have a very civil but robust and I think a great exchange of ideas. Uh, so let's get right to it. So Bakari, why don't we start with you? Um, so the question is, you know, what is the best pathway to prosperity and achieving your American dream? So you want me to tie in my intro here too? And thank you for that. Oh, they turned up back on the light. It was, I the felt like I was, was worse though. That, I felt that, like I was yeah, in I'm a concert here. I didn't know okay, if I, I was did it. Travis Scott or not. <laughs> um, so, so first of all, I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, uh, where we have three stoplights and a blinking light. And my mom and dad would always tell me, uh, the two most important words in the English language are the words thank you, and they're not nearly said enough. And so I just want to start by saying thank you to uh, all of you all uh, for being here. I want to say thank you to the Steamboat Institute. I was looking at all the pictures on the wall. Charles and I had this amazing opportunity to be here on this stage, a stage that was walked by people like LBJ himself and Ronald Reagan. And uh, we, I saw Queen Elizabeth back there and Barack Obama and John Lewis. And so just to be uh, in the same uh, arena that those greats once walked. I just want to say thank you. And to all the students who are here and watching, in the words of the great American poet, uh, Sean Carter, also known as Jay-Z, um, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us this evening. So thank you for, for coming. I, I want to, in answering that question, give some framework about who I am and my background, because I, I firmly believe uh, we don't do enough meeting people where they are. And I think that the number one problem we have in this country is we have an empathy deficit. And that empathy deficit shows itself in our political conversation. Um, I'm a child of the civil rights movement. My father helped form a small fledgling civil rights organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, also known as SNCC. Um, he served under both Stokely Carmichael and John Lewis um, as vice presidents and secretaries of those organizations. He led the search mission in Philadelphia, Mississippi to look for the bodies of Goodman, Schroener, and Cheney. And in 1968, he was shot in what's called the Orangeburg Massacre and imprisoned. Um, he became the first and only one man riot in the history of this country. And so my framing of the way that I look at the world po politically, culturally, um, socially, uh, is through the lens of being a child of that movement. I had an opportunity to serve my hometown of Denmark, South Carolina, Bamberg, Barnwell, and Orangeburg where the poverty level was something that was unimaginable. And so I think that the answer to the question to get there is that um, I always, and I think Charles will appreciate this, I don't think anything about this country is irredeemable. I do think, though, we have to reimagine what she looks like. And I think that there is a role uh, for government in deconstructing systems of oppression that prevent people from attaining, attaining their, their greatest potential. Um, and when I'm, I'm not talking about these individual one-on-one -on -one sensationalized conversations, but instead I'm talking about systems. And I think deconstructing those systems allows people to uh, integrate their own potential, integrate uh, whatever they want to do in the private sector. And I think that there is a natural merging when those building blocks are, are taken away. And I'm not talking about, in that statement, I'm not necessarily talking about equity, equality. I'm talking about equity. And those are two vastly different terms. And I think the focus, if government's focus is on ensuring um, that there's a dance floor, you know, everyone else can get out there and show that they can dance. All right. Bakari, thank you. Uh, we have something in common. My ancestors are from Denmark, so we're both from Denmark. <laughs> you know, I will tell you, when I'm at the bar and everybody's like, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from Denmark. And they say, what? <laughs> you don't look like it. Denmark, small town, is nine miles away from a town called Norway. And, <laughs> and in between Denmark and Norway are two unincorporated towns called Finland and Sweden. This is a true story. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Charles, you're from a very different place. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's, let's hear your response. My son what did is have the a best? girlfriend from Denmark for three years now in college, so South that's as close. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you all very much for coming out. I uh, really do appreciate it. Um, so 
my background is uh, I essentially had two childhoods. Uh, my first childhood, my father was in the Army, and uh, we traveled every year. And, I mean, I was born in New York. I was born in Harlem. We lived in Pittsburgh, then Texas, San Antonio, uh, Germany and Japan, back to Pittsburgh, Texas, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia. And it was an amazing life, particularly in the 60s and the 70s. It was sort of, uh, to be quite honest with you, it, it, it masked all of the issues that were going on in the country to grow up in that sort of an environment. I didn't understand, uh, you know, the, the issues of race or any of that stuff. I really didn't. It was just... It was just so idyllic. You know, you go outside, you play, get on your bike, come home, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, get on your bike and play some more. And then one day I came home from school and um, we were in Fort Lee, Virginia. And my mom said, we're leaving. So her and my dad had broke up. <clears throat> so me and my mom and my two younger brothers, we all got on a, on a bus and we caught a bus from there from our two story house with a guest room, my own room, never locked the doors. And we went to Harlem which at the time was the most dangerous, poorest neighborhood in America. And it was the ultimate culture shock. All four of us lived in a room inside of an apartment. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just absolutely amazing. I, the first time, when we first got to the building of her childhood friend who let us stay with her, uh, you know, first of all, they had an elevator, which blew my mind. <laughs> so, but um, then the elevator had this weird smell. <clears throat> and I know it was the paint. Turned out it was pee on the, on, in the elevator. And so, you know, I'd never seen anything like it, like the violence, but also the energy. It was so crazy, right? Walking down the street, music's coming out of a car, coming out of a window, coming out of a boombox. So you had this combination of energy, you had this combination of violence, and this, and this overall uh, poverty. Uh, you know, we got our first apartment, and for the first winter, we didn't have heat or hot water. This is a winter in New York. And we had lived all over the world, and we always moved into a place, and it was freshly painted, and every time you turn on the thing with H, hot water came out. So to that point in my life, I never thought about money. Not a single day in my life did I think about money, but I was the oldest, and I just had to do something. So while I worked, I hustled. The first thing I did was I would get paper towels and Windex and clean windows and stoplights. I uh, got a job at a bodega shoveled snow. I mean, whatever I did, I'd just been hustling straight since I'm 12 years old. But I equated money with Wall Street because I think everybody does that at a certain age. And uh, when I was around 13, I started reading the journal, which I got to tell you, if you ever go back and look at a journal, the Wall Street Journal from the 1970s, all these lines and boxes and numbers, it was crazy. I don't even, you could turn it sideways, upside down. It was just nuts to try to read this thing. And I kept reading them and I would get them and I would read them. And finally, I, I, I started to figure it out a little bit. And when I was 14 years old, I told my mom, I'm going to work on Wall Street. I bought my first mutual fund when I was 17. She had the co-sign in my first stock when I was 18. And I joined the Air Force to go to college. And when I got out of the Air Force, I got a job at EF Hutton. And uh, it was a great job, learning-wise, not pay-wise. My first year was 13000 I always tell people, if you look at the organizational chart, you start at the top, go all the way to the bottom, and then flip it over. <laughs> that was me right there. Um, so I had a chance to become a broker at a very small brokerage firm. The only catch is that it was 100% um, commission. So at this time, my daughter was almost a year old. I said, okay, I'm going for it. And I would work day and night <clears throat> and calling people up, and it's like, hi, this is Charles playing. <laughs> oh, so not, okay. Hello, this is, you know, just slamming the phone, just slamming the phone. And I swear I got lucky. Some guy called up like in my first week because I'm calling these old yellow pages. That's all they had in the back room. I was just a phone and yellow pages. I don't think the students know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's good because the old folks didn't know about the thing you were talking about, right? That Q code thing. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, there used to be this big book, a giant book with phone numbers in them. <laughs> so, so anyway... I, you go through the book, and you're just calling all these folks up, and finally I, uh, some guy said, hey, you know, you read well, but what do you want? That was my epiphany. I never read the script after that. I spoke to everybody, and, uh, you know, one thing led to another, finally made a good check. The day I got paid my first good check, my check, because I was 100% commission, I didn't make any money until then, my daughter had been wearing the same diapers for over 24 hours, and we had one can of food in the house. So I made it just by the skin of my teeth. And I wouldn't have made it. I couldn't have worked like, I was working like 15 hours a day 
calling people when they were slamming their phone on me. I couldn't have made it without thinking about her future. So that's what I'm about. I'm about the future, our future as a country, uh, as, as a people. Um, I'm a rose-colored glasses kind of guy. I've seen it all. I've tried to help everyone. And, and I, I feel like I'm blessed to be born in America. And I feel like I can just do my best as I'm alive to help other people realize their dreams. First off, let them make sure that they know that they can dream. All right. And then go from there. Perfect. Charles, uh, thank you. So, Bakari, I want to uh, uh, pick things up, what you said about being the child of a civil you know, rights family. Uh, so for a lot of conservatives, they would say, well, you know, the fact that the civil rights movement happened uh, was really, you know, it was necessary, it was noble, but at the same time, if, if you believe that your inherent rights come from God and they come from the creator, and it was government that was suppressing your rights uh, as African Americans, myself as a woman, and then to have the government come and uh, give it back to you, how can you then congratulate government for doing, getting out of the way? Is, isn't that really a conservative philosophy to say, you know, the civil rights movement was actually about getting the government out of the way because the government was suppressing people? That question was a hell of a roller coaster. I, had to, <laughs> I was following it up and down and around. Uh, that's an interesting, in, interesting question. So I, to my conservative friends, I would, I would say pause and back up first, because I think that the premise of the question doesn't underscore the inherent and necessary analysis in talking about the movement. Um, Every ounce of political change we've had in this country has been because of blood that's flown in the streets of this great country. You don't have the 64 and 65 Voting Rights Act without the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, some people in here may be old enough to remember the first images of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but it was the first time that many white Americans had seen the bludgeoning of black bodies coming across that bridge on Bloody Sunday in Selma. It is the power of television. That That power of television. It showed it at 6 o'clock news. Um, So you don't get 64 and 65 Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act without that. You don't get the Fair Housing Act, which is essential, because if you want to talk about governmental interference at a time, I mean, and, and still some of the ramifications thereof, which prevent the ascertainment of wealth, you can talk about redlining. Which was created by FDR. Red, redlining mm-hmm. on the oh yeah, yeah okay well I was just yes. let me get to 68 because Sorry. I'm like I, we're in here so let yes. me, let's 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 kind of get to this 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 whole thing Absolutely. but the civil rights the vote the excuse me the the vote the, the Fair Housing Act doesn't happen without the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. I mean we don't even take the Confederate flag down off the, the State House of South Carolina if nine black folk don't get killed in a church right and so I, I want I, I hear your point that you're making but I don't think you can make that political point without underscoring. The, the actual human carnage and the sacrifices that were made by those individuals. Now, if you want to talk about the political persuasion and what happened when, we can go back to when the parties changed in Philadelphia in 1948. You're going to have a hard time debating with me about the creation of Dixiecrats because I'm from South Carolina and there's no greater Dixiecrat in this country than Strom Thurmond Jr. who used the filibuster to protest the Civil Rights, the Civil Rights Act by saying segregation now, segregation forever and reading a phone book bringing it all the way back to the phone book, <laughs> uh, reading a phone book to do that. Um, you know, I, I don't really think, and I'm not saying your question doesn't matter, but I don't think looking at it through that lens matters at all. There's still groups of people in this country that are suffering, um, whether or not you're talking about the fact that in this country we now punish kids because of the zip code that they're born into, or the fact that in many communities, including where I'm from, Denmark, South Carolina, you don't have access to clean water, or the fact that we have a criminal justice system that's in tatters, and you can look at people who've done it all right, like Philando Castile, but he was still killed. He was still murdered. Um, and so you, or the environmental injustices that we have in this country. And so when you look at all of those things, I think that, uh, you know, you can, am I congratulating government? Uh, no. But what I am saying is that there is a role to play to deconstruct those systems, which don't allow people to live up to their full potential. Sure. Government systems that need to be deconstructed. And to that point, uh, I want to ask you, Charles, about the issue of um, police departments. So, uh, if, if Charles, if you're coming from the the, the small government philosophy, broadly speaking, um, and then uh, you have instances like Philando Castile, uh, as Bakari mentioned, uh, where you have police who are uh, in some communities they say that they are, uh, you know, being over policed. Uh, 
Um, but then you have here in Austin, for example, there's a proposition that's on the ballot now, Proposition A, um, where you know, people here in Austin can vote about whether they're going to require two offices for every 1,000 people because uh, there's been a, a backlash because the Austin police has had to scale back. They say, we're having a shortage, people are retiring, um, and so people are calling and they're being told, if it's not a serious problem, don't call or call this other line. Um, so I guess, how do you think about this, this very real concern for a lot of people that uh, there's over-policing in some instances? How do you see the role of government when it comes to policing? Um, because you have, on the one hand, people saying, we need more police. And then you have other people <laughs> saying, civil rights are being violated. How do you see this? How does this fit into your lens as a conservative? Well, I think you need a government. Wait a minute, you're a conservative? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm a registered independent, so, uh, but I consider myself to be a conservative, although it depends on who you talk to, <laughs> but that's a different thing. Um, you can never be too liberal for some people or too conservative for others, I guess. But, you know, obviously there's a role for government, and I don't know that it's government itself, but the power of government as it gets larger and overwhelming. I think that's the threat. I think when it becomes this sort of beast, that feeds on itself and gets larger, more bureaucratic, and it's got to justify itself by taking more control over more facets and areas of our lives, and it becomes overwhelming. It never shrinks itself. You know? So that's what scares me with government. I, listen, my, my, my grandparents are from Uniontown, Alabama, uh, and just a remarkable story. They, they never had running water or, or, or indoor electricity, but they had their own farm, and they were self-sufficient. And they raised a big family. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, the things that went on there, you needed government to come and try to help. You know, you needed government to inter, intervene after looking away for so long. Uh, so with respect to the police, fast forward to where we are now. You know, growing up in Harlem, we had this acrimonious relationship with the police. You know, the police would come around the block and we, we you know, we yell, fight, scream, whatever. We had this real acrimonious relationship with them. But... When someone got shot, you were like, what the hell is the police? <laughs> so it's really crazy, right? You, you know, during the day you may get into a beef, but if your buddy just got shot or someone's running around with a gun and you call the police, the next complaint is, well, how come they didn't show up? Well, you know, they're not going to show up, right? And, and so we're all, it's so sad that we've kind of circled back to that. And I think the defund the police movement has been an unmitigated disaster. I mean, a lot of these places are saying, yeah, we kind of messed up. I, I don't think it's police per se. When I was growing up, they had this thing called the blue wall of silence. And unfortunately, I think there's, we're human beings. And anytime you get a bunch of human beings, there's going to be some flawed people. And I think, unfortunately, for a long time, the blue wall of silence allowed the bad apples, whether it's, you could say, one out of 100. But they would, the 99 would protect that one. And I think that's what change is changed or, and is changing, and that's what needs to change. You don't need to have one bad apple your quote-unquote brother, who's doing things that you would never do, that you wouldn't want your children to do as a police officer. So I have members of my family who are, who are police officers. They put their lives on the line every day. One is in a gang unit. He had the gang sign. So he was always a threat being shot even by a fellow cop. He didn't even know he was on the job. So, so it's, a, it's an amazing, noble profession. And I, and, I, and I think that within some of these, I think they ought, want to be appreciated, number one. I think they certainly are probably the most underappreciated public servants we have. Teachers but number two, well. number two, they have to, <clears throat> that blue wall of silence was my big problem. You know, allowing the bad seed in the batch ruin everything for everyone. And I think that's where we need uh, to, get, to get fixed. Uh, you know, and I think obviously I think, I, and by the way, I'm a big proponent of community policing. You know, I am, and, and, and also, listen, while we're on this subject, the sentencing laws, really. I mean, you want me to, 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 to tell you about somebody who committed a crime and then that person's out of jail in six months? <laughs> no way. You know, you heard my man's out and he's looking for you. No, no, uh-uh. You know, I mean, I've seen people murdered. I've seen people stabbed. I've seen people busted up, beaten up. And I've seen murderers. Sometimes they'll go down south. Sometimes they'll go to maybe Jamaica, wherever. And come back three or four months later. I can't. So our system is dealt is, is where people who are the true victims of crime can't fight back. They can't fight back. They can't even legitimately say, I'm going to 
squill on this person. I'm going to call the cops because they're, they're, they put themselves in prison uh, and, and, and their lives in jeopardy. So it's an untenable situation. You definitely need more police. You need better police relationship with the community. And anytime there's a bad seed, they should try to root them out. All right. Let me, yeah, Bakari, yeah, yeah let quick. me comment on that. What do you think I, about defund the police specifically? I mean, also. I think defund the police is a terrible slogan, but I think if you peel the layer of the onion back, then you can have a, a, a more substantive conversation on what defund the police really means. Defund the police is not saying that you're going to, in, in 95% of the time, Charles, it doesn't mean that you're just going to eliminate complete police departments. What you are saying, though, is that you're going to reallocate those dollars to things like mental health, recreation, those, some of those co-curricular activities, summer lunch programs, summer work programs, et cetera, some of these bloated blood budgets we have that we see across the country where you have militarized vehicles, et cetera. And I think that I th- one of the things, and, and probably the... Charles and I don't have a lot of daylight on this issue because substantive, I believe that it's one A and one B law enforcement and teachers are the public servants who do not get the respect they deserve in our communities. Right. I also come from the position that you should pay law enforcement better because that's my kind of free market belief that you pay for what you get. Right. You want better law enforcement officers. You pay them more. You'll get you'll get more people. Uh, more qualified, more quality people to to participate. But for me personally, to answer the question directly, I don't want less police. I just want better police. And from a policy perspective, you ask me, how do I fix it policy wise? I mean, it's simple. They can't agree on it in Washington, D.C., but I'll tell you quite simply, I think you should ban chokeholds. I think that you should follow the federal government and not be able to do no knock warrants between 10 and 6. I'm in Texas. What are y'all going to do in Texas if somebody knocks on your door, you don't know who it is, and comes in at 4 o'clock in the morning talking about we here to serve a warrant? You're going to shoot them. Nine times out of ten, they're going to shoot you back. And they're probably going to hit what you, what, what you were trying to do. So, so, you know, have that 10 to 6 a.m. no 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 knock warrants at night. I think you go even further than that. I think that um, you have to limit qualified immunity because you can't even get in the courtroom when you have these bad apples that we're talking about uh, you, you you look at you look but isn't it if it's qualified immunity isn't that the key word qualified that you have to show the evidence that you deserve no that's not accurate immunity. i mean as a, a and the only reason i know that is because as a civil yeah. rights attorney i deal with this mm-hmm. all the time you literally have to have a, a a situation on paper that is the exact same of another situation <clears throat> they just had two two uh cases that went up to the Supreme Court where they dealt with the issue of qualified immunity. There was a young black man who was sitting in a car. The car was parked legally. The police pulled him out. Another officer got in the passenger seat. He drove off and was shot. That fact pattern, however, didn't match up with anything else that had been sustained before under the law. And therefore, the officers weren't put on notice. And so it was kicked because of qualified immunity. I think you need to limit qualified immunity so that in cases like Botham John or Terrence Crutcher, we know the case of Botham John here in Texas, correct? They're able to actually have their day in court. And the last thing that I'll tell you, and I don't care if you're conservative or or, or progressive or liberal or Democrat or whatever we call ourselves these days, you should have a database for bad cops. If you have 14, 15 complaints in Austin, you should not be fired from the Austin Police Department and be able to go down and be lieutenant in the Houston Police Department. You can't be a social worker, a teacher, a nurse. You can't do anything like that. But those are simple things that make good, well, qualified immunity is a little bit more complicated, but those are things that we can actually agree on that would bring about necessary change in communities. It would require pushing back on unions, but uh, police unions. But I, I, I want to so move to the topic of inflation Just add to a couple things to that, though. The only thing is in... Because I don't want it to seem like I don't want to, uh, to pile on, on cops. You know, the, the police officers tell me, too, is they're worried about it being open season. Uh, it's already tough from a public perspective for many of them to do their job properly. Uh, and then in places like New York, they're making arrests and people throwing water bottles at them and cursing them out and things like that. But also, they don't want to think that every time they make an arrest and something goes wrong, they're going to end up in a civil suit or something like that. Like, it's... You know, if you pay them more, but they have to pay all that money to a lawyer, it doesn't matter anymore. So it's, it, it, I think it needs a more, uh, some sort of nuanced, elegant solution, if you will. Uh, but I think also we have to address crime, right? I mean, the spike in crime in this country, it, it makes the police officer's job hard. I mean, we're talking about the people who are called into to, uh, a potential criminal situation. And, 
And that's, that's what I'm really concerned about is this sort of, this inability to, to say, okay, such a person's committed a crime. Like, I don't ever use the term um, uh, uh, gun violence. I think it's people violence. You know, no gun ever jumped out of a drawer and shot itself. I, always, I, think, it, I think it mitigates, the, it takes away from culpability of the person and persons who actually pull the trigger. So I don't like the term gun violence because you're already kind of giving this person an out. And then there's another out because of where they lived. And then there was another out. And before you know it, someone who shot another kid across the street because they had a purple bandana or blue bandana and they had a red one uh, is now all of a sudden not culpable at all. And, and then if they're not culpable, anyone who's thinking about doing the same thing has the green light. And I think it's created a vicious cycle, you know, and, when I first moved to New York, that's the thing I never, I, that, that caught me, that I, you know, listen, it's, uh, I, you know, on, on, I never saw that kind of violence, repeat violence, and, and, and what, it, what it created was a sort of, like, I had fights growing up in, on army bases, and you fight, roll around in the grass, and like 10 minutes later, you're playing football, right? But when I got to Harlem, the fights were to the death. I mean, really, it was like, damn, you got to try to kill this person. You can't just fight him. I had a fight with a guy one time for 40 minutes, like 40 minutes. You know how many adults walked past us? No one broke it up. We, we covered a whole block and a half. I don't know how the hell we did that. I just, by the time it was over, looked up, we were a block and a half away where we started from. Well, and, I, think, I think you're making the case for a lot of parents to get involved, and we saw that in this school in Louisiana. That video? Some parents showed up, 40 dads oh, yeah. went to the schools. And, well, the anyway, parents let, obviously want to be involved, but I'm just yeah. saying, when you but have, Charles, an, when I, you have gotta, an environment that excuses, right. that excuses violence or, or erases culpability, then you're going to get violence, more, more violence, not less. All right. We're going to move to a different topic. Uh, inflation, because this is affecting everybody in this room. Uh, we're seeing double-digit increases in things like energy, paint at the pump, uh, heating your home. Um, and uh, President Biden has the Build Back Better plan. Uh, he says that this is a supply chain issue and that a lot of the programs that he wants to put in place will help alleviate the supply chain issues, uh, the employment issues, uh, and encourage uh, people to get back to work. So, Bakari, give us, give us the sell. I mean, I, I mean, I assume I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're a Democrat, it's your team, uh, you know, in the White House uh, and in the House and Senate. Um, Tell us why is this the better plan to beat inflation? And then Charles, your team is in the, the minority. How are you going to convince the team in power to, you know, people like Mansion? What's the answer? The only for thing I can convince them are polls. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, was so, like, I don't so, have it. We didn't. I didn't get my jersey before I came yeah. uh, here today. No, but okay. I don't well, have then, a team. Do you, what do you think about? What, do you think, no, I, I think inflation? That, what's the answer to inflation? What's the answer to inflation? And will Build Back Better make it better? Or so worse? I do think I do think that the transportation bill that we're passing. Um, Hopefully, when's, what's today? Tuesday? Yeah. Hopefully bring for a vote tomorrow night or, or Thursday. If things go as planned, I think it will help ex exponentially. I think that when people look at inflation, they're like, oh, my God, inflation. And they're like, pain at the pump. And then they say, I want to go back to last year when gas was $2.35. And I'm like, do you, are we not living in reality? Does anybody know what we were doing last year? At this time, do you know why gas was two dollars and thirty five cents? Because wasn't nobody going nowhere because we were quarantined. We were in the middle of a pandemic. So everybody's like, oh, my God, I want to go back to gas prices a year ago. Well, do you want to do the rest of what we were doing a year ago? Like you, this is the it, people's memory and political conversation is just sometimes it, it's intellectually dishonest. So I, it's not I, just gas, though. It's food as well. I mean, so, uh, so and let me, we can, did it, inflation Bloomberg, is a. Bloomberg inflation did a study a real, showing that inflation actually at the grocery store, it hurts black and Latino families. No, most. I mean, it hurts it, poor it, people. I mean, yeah. it, it hurts poor people. There's no, there's no doubt about it. And so, yes, you, you have these issues, but you asked about Build Back Better and a transportation plan. And I do think inflation will get better over time. I think you are going through a time period right now where it's very, very difficult for people who work extremely hard to make ends meet. You asked a bunch of questions. So I dealt with pain at the pump because that's the easiest one to dispel. But let's dig a little deeper, right? And let's talk about people who are working or who are not working. It, it, we have a wage problem in this country as well. I mean, you guys are brilliant. You guys, and, and this, now I'm in his, if you come, to, waiting, baby, if you come to civil rights law, you're in mine. Now, we're in, now I'm in his, his bailiwick, so I can't, I can't wait on it. But we have a wage problem in this country. 
I mean, when was the last time we raised the minimum wage? I mean, who, who, in, here is, who in here can live off $7.50? I mean, ask yourself a very serious question. I mean, I, I, I hear all my conservative friends, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm not saying it needs to be $30 or anything else, but let's swap. You live off $7.50 and tell me how you make ends meet. That's a very real non-political question. Well, and you Charles, cannot, to and, that and, point, and Charles, one more, is, one more point. I want to ask point. him about minimum wage. Yeah, so we're one more get point, though. I, I, you know, and this is where I disagree with a lot of my conservative friends, and I, I, I'll be extremely blunt. If you think people aren't working because they were getting an extra $300 in unemployment insurance, you should pay them more money. Like, that's not a complicated ideal. If people are staying at home, think about this, for $300, then you literally should pay them more. And, and what happens when you see companies in the private sector actually pay their employees what they're worth? You begin to see the performance of that company do that much better. Now, I'm not, I'm not for, you know, just everybody, give them everything you want and all this other stuff. But I do think we have to slice down the middle. And I think the Build Back Better, and, and first of all, I think the infrastructure bill, because you were, we were talking earlier, it, one of the, and, you, and you, were, you were razzing me a little bit uh, about, about government programs, et cetera. Well, you know what we need in this country? We need money spent on infrastructure. We have some of the worst infrastructure in the entire world transportation, broadband. There were kids who couldn't even access broadband during a pandemic, so they couldn't do virtual school. And what do you get the best ROI on, Charles? I think building highways, roads, bridges. I think, I think infrastructure spending gives you some of the best ROI. So, you know, call it what you want. So Your turn, Charles. Go ahead. I want to ask Charles about the minimum wage. Let me start with the gas prices because let me uh, debunk the debunk for a minute because this is not about versus last year. We're at a seven-year high. Crude oil prices went up November 4th of Maybe. last year. That's when they started to go up because President Biden declared war on fossil fuels. It's called supply and demand. If you limit supply but demand is here, guess what's going to happen to price? It's, it's, it's economics 101, and it's only going to get worse. If the fact of the matter is, is this forced issue, this trying to force you know, this, this sort of climate change, clean energy thing, without letting it happen more organically over a smarter time frame, we are going to be using fossil fuels for a long time. Why are we making them more expensive? Why did the president of the United States ask OPEC, OPEC, to drill more and not the folks in Texas? Why? And now you've got this ESG thing on Wall Street, and it's hard to even raise money for a major project. Last week, ExxonMobil said they were thinking about not drilling on their largest project. Uh, it's just weird, right? So gas prices, crude oil prices went up the very day after President Biden was elected because he has declared war on fossil fuels. And uh, it was already in trouble. Investments in fossil fuels have dropped dramatically over the last decade. And, and a, lot of major, a lot of major drilling and opportunities right beneath our feet are going to stay there. And again, it's fine for some people, but the poorest people in this country are paying the biggest, the, the bearing the biggest brunt of that. The other part on the money, the free money has had a, a negative impact uh, on inflation. So we had three major fiscal stimulus packages, right? No one disagrees when you shut down the economy. When the government tells you not to go to work, then someone's got to compensate you. Right. It's just like taking your land and your property. But we've had three of them. And the average family has gotten about $40,000. So it's not 300 bucks. This last one, the $2 $1.9 trillion rescue plan, out of that, 50% went to pay down bills, 30% was saved, and the rest was spent, the stimmies. So people have actually saved up a lot of money. And in a lot of these households, it's not just one person. So some of these households have taken in $80,000. They can afford to wait for the right job. You know, some of these states, a lot of states just only ended their unemployment benefits last month. I do believe as some of that money starts to fade, um, that they will, you know, start looking for a job. By the way, wages are going up dramatically, particularly for the lowest quintile. But they have been since 2016, particularly 2017, up until the pandemic hit. But Charles, Luke, the, the truth is that 
all the wage growth this year, and Bakari brought up wages is very important. It's all been eaten up by inflation. There's been well, no wage get to that growth point yet. because of inflation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go back year over year, just the, if you, the last six months in a row, real wages have been negative. The last six months in a row. Down 0.9%, down 1.1%, down 0.8%, whatever it is. Every single month for the last six months, even though you went to the store with more money, you came out with fewer bags. And that's how insidious inflation is. So, you know, I, I, think, I think that last package was too much. I, I really do. I think, I, think it, I think the inflation also hurts working families and it creates animosity. So when I was growing up, and I used to, it's, it's a boggle my mind. You know, you look out the window and all the kids would be playing and we'd all have on the same clothes and we lived in the same building. Some people worked, some didn't. But we all had the same thing. I wonder why my mom worked. I really did. I said, why the hell are you working? We got, we, you know, we don't have anything extra. Why don't you stay at home? She says not that, that wasn't the way she was raised. So that's what bothers me with, when, when with some of these programs can actually s- seduce you into, into a, pla- a, a, a placate you into a, peer, a place where you now you don't go after things. You don't dream. You don't try to become a better person in, ter- in terms of nurturing God's gifts. You may have a gift. You might be an architect. You might have something in there. But you never even think about nurturing it. And that's what I think is the most insidious part about, you know, when we, when we start to write too many checks to people. The inflation is a byproduct of that. The supply chain thing is a part. That's a part also. That's- uh, but, I, you know, th- between crude oil going through the roof, th- they, look at a chart. Look up, look up a crude oil chart when you go back, wherever you go tonight. And then also these three rounds of stimulus. This last one was unnecessary, and it, and it has played a role in inflation and people not going back to work. All right, I'm going to give Bakari one last chance to respond. Then we've got to go to immigration. Then we're going to go to Q&A. Well, I, I, didn't, I mean, I, Charles is brilliant. I think we disagree on some fundamental points, but that's why we're here and we're not – on the same team, per se. I, I personally have never met anybody who enjoys being on welfare. I personally have never met anybody who enjoys living that life of public housing. I personally never met, never, never met anybody who was in public housing and said, damn, I'm going to stay here. So I, I think that there's often time... Were all these people going to school, what were they doing to get out of public housing? They were trying. All of them. They were trying. I mean, I, 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 I grew up here. I went to. I mean, you and I grew up from the same. All of them. Not all of them, but the overwhelming majority. I mean, we 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 grew I up in different was. regions. I wish it but was. I, I think that that's. I think that that is a red herring that people have in these debates uh, about poverty. But even more importantly, one of the policy points I wanted to talk about is we went around and around, and I, I you, Charles stands on on what he does daily, and he does that way better than I do. So I. I dare not push back on that. But I will say that the child tax credit, that's something we didn't talk about, has reduced poverty in this country by 30 percent. And the fact that these individuals are getting those three hundred dollar checks a month now is going to help. And will if those we, mothers ever go back to work? Yes. All right. All right. So, yeah, the, I mean, so I, it won't I just, be cradle to grave. Because that's what I'm talking about. It's. When you say the poverty line, it's an arbitrary number. It's twenty six thousand dollars. So now, so now, so now it's twenty eight thousand. Hey, we've got all these people above the poverty line. It's an arbitrary number. Make it thirty thousand, and they're back under it. Will the people who are getting these checks now have more kids and get bigger checks, or will they say, okay, I'm going to get this check and and I'm going to? How, what percentage of them do we acknowledge will, will the fact, get their way out of but there? But do we acknowledge the fact that there are people who work forty hours a week in this country and they're still poor? Do we acknowledge the fact that there? I mean, people act like, and my conservative friends, when we had these discussions, act like there's no such thing as the working poor. They think people stay at home and get checks. No, no, I'm talking the about is how the, do we get people from not being poor because those checks, they get those checks and they're still poor. No, I everyone and, and everyone and and and, and 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 that I grew up with was poor, and most of them were getting welfare checks. So that didn't make them not poor. No, I, and I, I don't disagree, but I think that that allows them to at least keep their head above water. What has to happen? In, in concert with that is we have to do the innovation where I think we agree. We have to make sure that in a lot of these poor school districts, particularly in the South, we do things like teach health professions and science, technology, engineering and math. Right. But I don't want people out here. It, it's obscene to me that you can work 40 hours a week and still fall below the poverty line. That's obscene to me. 
And I think that it is, is what we call insidious on one side. I think we have to be honest and call it insidious on the other side. All right, we're going to leave it right there. We're going to go to immigration. Last question. So, uh, Bakari, I want to start with you because this was a report in 2010 from the Obama U.S. Civil Rights Commission. Uh, the commission found that about 6 in 10 adult black males have a high school diploma or less and are disproportionately employed in the low-skilled labor market in likely competition with immigrants. The commission found that there are significant effects in occupations such as meatpacking and construction, that the, you know, these lower-skilled, lower-educated black men were in direct competition with immigrants, illegal or otherwise. But I want to focus specifically on illegal immigrants uh, because that's a big uh, hot-button issue for both parties. The question of abolishing ICE. Do you, what do you think about abolishing ICE, and do you think that if you abolish ICE and you allow open flows from the border, this has a disproportionate impact on black men, for example, no. uh, lower-income Americans? I think, no. And then for you, Charles, I want to get your <laughs> response. Um, there are a lot of people who believe in the free market, a lot of Chamber of Commerce-type conservatives, who they want the same thing. They want, they want the, the, the free flow of illegal immigration to compete with uh, Americans and to drive down the wages, according to this report, do you agree with that perspective? We'll start with you, Bakari. No, I think it's it's a it's a, a trope to uh, say that black folk, particularly black men in this country, are in this battle with immigrants for a certain type of job. I mean, if we're going to keep it one hundred, as we say sometimes, the fact is that that many of those jobs. They don't black these these black folk that we're talking about don't want them anyway, um, and so I, I think that it's a it's a it's a trope and it's unfortunate that that sometimes enters into our 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 dialogue. You asked me about ICE, I, I wouldn't sit on stage and say that we should disband ICE, but I would remember that ICE was founded in two thousand and one, if I'm not mistaken. 2000 or two right right after yeah people uh, act like people act like ice has been here since this <laughs> since 1776 since i mean the ice age yeah it's a no it's a new it's a new concept but i do think you need immigration and customs enforcement um i do think that we have to have a better asylum process but if we want to cut back on illegal immigration in this country i think that you have to have a process i i, I recall being a fan of what Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio did. Y'all remember the Gang of Eight? The Gang of Eight could not even stand a, a litmus test today uh, in, in, in the Republican Party. I mean, if you think about what they put forth, their immigration ideals, I can't even remember who all eight of them were. I don't even know if some of them are still there or not. But the ideals were not bad. I mean, they, it, was, it was policy. You don't get everything you want, and you do not get some of the things that you do want. But I do think one of the things that they discussed in that Gang of Eight proposal when you talk about immigration and some of the things that we leave out of this conversation is what do we do about these employers who are hiring illegal immigrants? I think that we have to have significant enforcement against those individuals who are hiring illegal immigrants who come. Um, I, you've seen over time throughout the Obama administration, the Trump administration and even now the Biden administration, you see uh, the number of individuals uh, has steadily increased and ticked up who have been arrested, who've been deported, etc. cetera. Um, but immigration is probably the most complicated issue we have in this country. And it's going to take a bipartisan, bipartisan approach to fix it. I'm just not sure that the parties right now are in a position where there's a political will or want to fix it. Well, I think immigration in of itself and, and the notion that we should control our borders is pretty cut and dry. Yes, we should control our borders, right? I mean, that's just the 1.7 million people are, uh, who are detained uh, for the last fiscal year. Uh, you know, that's all about entry. And uh, the DACA thing obviously gets complicated, um, particularly when you have so many these kids who have now even served in the military, not kids, young adults now. Um, but, you know, a lot of times... Those those jobs that you were saying that that black men were in competition, and, and, and Bakari pointed out that the brothers don't want those jobs. You know, you still have to say, well, if you don't want a job, how do you have the luxury of not taking that job? And that's where I get back to. You know, if you if the job sucks, there's no doubt about it. But also, if you dropped out in eighth grade, or or you have a eighth grade reading level. It's hard to be competitive. And this is where I get really concerned about 
this notion of, okay, just naturally, the, the, the minimum wage argument is sort of weird because there's not that many people on it, honestly. You go to Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, and it's a very tiny fraction of overall workers, but how much do you pay someone based on their skills? And if you overpay them, are, there, are they ever motivated to skill up, to get their skills better? And are you doing them any favors by saying, I'm going to overpay you for these skills, but you will never in turn develop anything more? You know, so, you know, back in that Union town, they opened up a, um, where my mom is from in Alabama, they opened up a catfish farm. They couldn't get the brothers to work there. So I do agree that employers who employ uh, immigrants who are here illegally are culpable, but I will tell you, many of them cannot find local American workers. And I do tip my hat to these folks who come here and want a piece of this American dream because they are serious. They are, their kids are going to graduate valedictorian. Their grandkids are going to start businesses. They, are, they want the American dream. We bought a house in January, and I tell you, one day I looked outside because, you know, we're working from home. I was doing my show from the house. And we had eight people cutting the grass, someone fixing a fountain, and someone doing something else. And I, they, none of them were born in America. They were all born south, of, uh, and they were doing an amazing job. Absolutely amazing job. When it snows in my neighborhood, I don't see any person in my town on welfare with a shovel. But I tell you what, pickup truck comes around, they jump out, how much, boom, bang, hit it with military precision, clean the whole thing up. All right, Charles, we're going to leave it right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was tired of where we were going. I'm just trying no, to no, say, no, I'm trying no, to say, I, I, we no, get let it. me make no, one last we got to go to audience questions. Oh, real quick, because, because I'm trying to make the point that if you pay people not to work, they're not going to work. Right. And others who are taking advantage of that opportunity, they're going to climb the ladder of a success. That's what being an American is all about. All right. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Bakari. We're going to go to audience questions. I'm going to start with Bakari here, uh, and, and we'll get Charles' response also. Um, it's an interesting framework. So it says, should health care, paid parental leave for all, et cetera, be considered a human right? And they're asking, since the biggest push for a lot of these programs is because they're considered a right by their advocates. Do you believe uh, that it's a right? I believe access to a quality education and first-class first class health care should be a right. Yes, and not should be, it is. Yes. But it, is it in the Constitution? Do we really want to talk about what's in the Constitution and what's not? That's a but hell of a slippery as, slope with a black guy and a woman talking. Yeah, but, but, I'm, just saying, but I'm saying uh, as far as, uh, you know, is there, a, a, you know, our governing document, the Constitution, that says someone is, is guaranteed access to a, a product or a, or a service? The Constitution that wasn't writ for, written by or for me and you? That Constitution? Well, the Constitution had an amendment process that was built to make Correct. it better. But I'm just, I mean, like, so, so yeah, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, should people have access in the greatest country in the world to quality health care? Yes. Do you know where I'm from in Denmark, South Carolina, which is, which we, when we didn't expand Medicaid is one of the, one of the quirky issues of the Affordable Care Act. We're one of the states, Nikki Haley's our governor. Was, it, was our governor, I was in the state house. We didn't expand Medicaid. Our, I lost my hospital in Bamberg County. Um, the closest hospital is 35 minutes away. So my mom had um, leukemia. And one day she was walking up the steps with, uh, she was weaker, but she was walking up the steps with two grocery bags. By the way, I don't know why older people do that, but I always tell them, you know, one hand free, but she tripped and fell and busted her mouth open. And uh, just thank God, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. My sister's a doctor. My brother uh, is in, uh, it, it, in, in the private sector. And so we were able to call around and get somebody there. She was sitting on the steps just bleeding out of her mouth, like just profusely, um, because there wasn't a way for um, a medical provider to get to her and take her where she needed to go. This is in 2010, 11. We're not talking about 1967, 68. This is where if you have a heart attack, it's a death sentence. And so I'm all about making sure people have access to quality care. I think that is so important. Charles, is it a right? And it is a right, in my opinion. I mean, I... Is it a right? Um, I think it's the right thing to do. That's, not, I, the answer. that's not the question. I know, I, but that's my answer. <laughs> to get but let me Charles. just say this, though, because I think, I really think some of these things, though, 
are more important if they're f- facilitated and done on the local level. In other words, I'm just worried about the, the over. Again, we're getting back to this large federal government with its tentacles everywhere, uh, and and you know it becomes a bargaining chip, a poker chip for other things and other programs. Um, you know, so I don't know that it's it's technically a right, but I do think uh, that because of our Ju- Judeo-Christian background and and the inherent compassion of Americans, that it's it's the right thing to do. But I do con- I do worry. Uh, when it becomes a federal government uh, issue, because I don't, when it comes particularly education, uh, and certainly even uh, on a medical side. Do All you right. think it's a right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness? Get ask him that question. No, I mean, I just, you, <laughs> you frame the question. I'm the moderator. And I don't know how you can be unhealthy and have life or liberty or pursue happiness, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. When my wife had our twins, uh, she hemorrhaged, lost seven units of blood. She almost, she almost died giving birth to our twins. And the reason I tell that story is because black women are four times more likely to die during childbirth than white women in this country. And it crosses socioeconomic levels, right? But having good quality health care kept my wife alive. And so she can pursue life, liberty, and my kids can pursue happiness. So is it a right? Yeah. Well, praise God, she's, she's We did helping. a lot of that, too. We, yeah. we sing and we danced, and it's a tough night, but we made it through, Charles. Yeah, no, yeah I, I said that college prayer. Some of y'all know what this is, like when you drink too much on Thursday, and you in the, in the bathroom on, like, Friday morning, you say, dear God, if you get me through this, I'll never do X, Y, and Z again. <laughs> I was by the hospital, but I said, dear God, you get me through this. I'm not going to tell you what sins I ran down, but I said, I will never do this, this, this again. He came through. I always does. It was only uh, three things? It no. was <laughs> <laughs> All right, Charles, we got a question from the audience for you. All right. How can we leave it to free enterprise when corporations do not provide living wages to their employees or health insurance and CEOs are paid more than ever? Well, you know, it's, I think just that that's sort of a, a real big fallacy. Again, we're in a very competitive job market, and if someone has a marketable skill, they're going to get paid uh, a, certain, a certain amount of money. Uh, you know, and, and I think any business that doesn't do that is not going to really survive. It's, it's a dumb business. I've seen businesses that don't want to pay people and, and, and quite frankly, talented people walk away and they go somewhere else and they work. So an in, in issue in order to survive. And I think there's this sort of an antiquated thinking like, you know, they, the, the, the term is out there so often and it's, and it's so overused. Uh, you know, wages, particularly now, and, but over the last five years have gone up dramatically, particularly for, for lower wage earners. But, you know, we're so focused on that part of the issue. Like when someone tells me, vote for me and I'll get you higher minimum wage, I'm insulted. You can't get my vote for a higher minimum wage. I'm a maximum wage kind of guy. And, and this is where the focus should be. How do we skill people up so this is not even faintly, even remotely a question anymore? Because that's the way the world is going anyway. You know, these jobs that are repetitive and you flip a burger and you do this, the robots are moving in, artificial intelligence is moving in. Uh, so it, it's almost even, uh, it's, it, it's, it, listen, corporate pay, I don't like corporations where the CEO doesn't do a great job and still makes a, a lot of money. And that, that is an issue. Some of them, they do an amazing job. They return value to shareholders. Am I begrudging Elon Musk for being the richest man in the world? And his, and his stock is up. If you bought a stock, you wouldn't be upset. You know, people who buy the vehicles mostly are, are progressives. They're, they shouldn't be upset. So, you know, and it's, and it's ironic because the same people wouldn't begrudge a basketball player who makes a $50 million a year. But how dare someone who's running a company on, four, on, on all continents with 80,000 employees make that, that money? I think there's too much focus on what other people are making and too much focus on this thing that's such a mi- minor issue when the grand scheme of things is we're in the fourth industrial revolution, we're not prepared for it, and we can lose our grip, our grip in terms of, uh, in terms of where we are in the world. Remember, this is where we are now affords us capital to come in to build business. We have the world's reserve currency. We never, never, never want to lose it. Once you lose it, your country never has the kind of might that when France lost it to Britain, they were never the same. When Britain lost it to us, they were never the same. And if we ever lose it to anyone, it would probably be the Chinese, we will never be the same. And all of these things, we'd be thinking about the good old days when people were making X amount of money. 
So, so you know, I, I would reframe that and say, hey, I, I, don't, I don't think there's so many businesses out there and so many people aren't making money because the facts just don't bear that out. Uh, but what I will say is we should be focused more on how do we compete for these amazing jobs that are developing right now that will lead the world into the next century and, and pay people big time money instead of squabbling over the 1%, less than 1% of people who are getting minimum wage. So I, I agree with a lot of what Charles says because I believe in the free market. I believe in free enterprise. I don't have a problem with people making money at all. I mean, I don't. I, I want you to, I, I expect my kids to be, a, I think we need to help people become more skilled, right? I think that we need to, because right now we have an entire generation that we're not preparing for a 21st century global economy. But there's, a, there's like a, a, another side to that equation that people just want to put a period there and it deserves a comma. Because right now you have people who go to schools in school districts where their heating and air don't work, where their infrastructure is falling apart, where their teachers push around carts because it's not enough space. And regardless of whether or not you want them to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, they have no boots. Right. So, yeah, I, I believe in all of that and I want all of that. And I also want to make sure that we're preparing people to compete. And I also don't want working people to be poor. Like, I don't feel like in, in politics I have to fit in a box. I want Charles to make a ton of money. All of it. <laughs> and pay taxes on all of it. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> then I want, I, I want young people in this country to be able to dream and innovate, right? And have the resources and tools necessary to dream and innovate. And then I want people who are working their asses off not to have to struggle, but to be able to live. And I don't think, I think that's what America looks like. And I'm unashamed to believe in all three of those. Can I just say one thing, though? With you the, disagree the with something on that? Side? No. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, I did what you He's said. Trying. Although, He's although, trying. He's trying, Charles. Give although him a Although this reminds me of FDR and the four freedoms, that freedom from fear, this sort of idea that our uh, lives should be so easy and, you know, we should never worry about anything. That's sort of the, that's the thing that sparks us sometimes, that, that fear or that anxiety or, you know, that... Just if we all woke up and everything was carefree and our rent was paid for us and our electric was paid and, and we had nothing to work for, it would be tough. It wouldn't be, you know, that would take away a big motivating factor. But my thing is, I'm big on education. You know, I was on the board of a uh, charter school in the South Bronx for many years, and, and I'm trying to do some things on the STEM side. I, you know, you, the progressive education for black people, Hispanic people in this country is just so sad, man. I really, honestly, I think that's one of the biggest crimes what going on. What is progressive on. education? And in New York City, and Washington D.C., and these places, man. If you look at the reading level, and it's sort of like they 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 want to give them the easy work. They don't want to push them. By the time this twelfth grade, they're reading at an eighth grade le re level, and then it's sort of like a Faustian deal. Hey, we undereducated you, but tell you what, we'll get you higher minimum wage, public housing. And this and that, if you keep us in office. Well, Charles, you got a question on education from the audience here. Can and they say, Charles. The bunk, well, but, uh, <laughs> I like how you I'm going to use that on CNN or not. <laughs> Let me debunk the debunk. The debunk. debunk. Like no, but Charles, I mean, you're talking about public education. We have an audience question here. And thank you all for feeding the questions. Um, and they asked you, Charles, specifically, they say, if you believe everyone should have the opportunity to nurture their dreams and believe in true meritocracy, how do you suggest making the public school more equitable for lower income citizens and the most vulnerable to receive a lower quality, uh, you know, for people who are already stuck receiving a low quality education, how do we, how do we improve it? Uh, and how do you suggest supporting and retaining teachers to provide this quality education? Well, the bigotry of low expectations. Soft uh, bigotry. Yeah, the soft bigotry of, of uh, low expectations. We're in the home. The, I mean, you got to get it right in know, Texas. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, W. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the curriculum, is, the rigors have got to be stronger. These, these progressives have to believe that black people and black kids are smart enough to do it. You can't keep coddling people and then when they get to a certain age, feel sorry for them and, take, and tell them, well, I'll substitute because of the lacks of substance I gave you to nourish your intelligence, your intellect, I'll make up for it on the other end with public housing. So first and foremost, let's get the rigors in there. 
you know, and, and, and let's get the tough questions in there. There's a guy named Jim Clark. Jim Clark has a distinction of starting three separate companies, all like big time billion dollar companies. So a book was written by him. I think it was Jim, I think it was Lewis who wrote the book. Um, John Lewis, uh, Jim Lewis. Uh, I think he wrote Liar's Poker and a few of them. Anyway, in the book, everywhere this guy Clark went, he had a guy who went with him, and he was born in India. And he came from a very poor town in India. So the author is like, can I, do you mind if I talk to, you, to this guy who's been with you everywhere too? I want to get his perspective. He, so he told him a little bit about him. And he said one day his sister was the prettiest girl in the village. And one day he came home uh, from school and she was getting dolled up. She was going to go on a date. And so he said, well, who are you going on a date with? And when she said, he, when she told him who it was, he said, he's like the ugliest guy in the village. And know what his sister said? Yeah, but he's the smartest. We need to bring that. That's got to be the cool thing. And that's got to be the thing that we get the kids into from day one. I just think that we're, the, the school books, look at these school books. Look how many, each of these books also have more than two sets of tests. I discovered that helping my son with homework years ago. It's like, oh, what the heck? So they have two sets of tests. They give them the easier test. They're not preparing them because they don't think they're smart enough. And that, ironically, is the very definition of racism. All right, we're going to let Bakari debunk the debunking, yeah, and then we're going to talk about CRT. I, mean, I, I saw some nodding, too. Actually, none of that is quite accurate. I would disagree with Charles on all of that. Uh, and the reason being is because I know you, if people like to talk about Baltimore and New York and D.C., well, in, in education, let's just look at the most underperforming states in the country. Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, Louisiana. And at last check, that ain't progressive education. If you want to look at... Favorite, though. Look at the black students in New York City and the white and Asian students in New York City. Like, uh, if you come to Mississippi, the gap is going to be like this. And maybe down here... No, well, that's the point, about, I'm I mean, talking I, about it, something so, is wrong in that city I don't, it's, where but, certain but people in that city are here yeah, but, and the black yeah, guys but, are there. But, but Charles' the, point is that red, you know, education is largely a state matter. And he's saying if you look at the red states... No, you're going to see comments. Comments. It's oh, yeah. if, if you're both low, if the white kids are here and the, and <laughs> okay. the black kids are here, Charles, let's, just let's listen to what I'm for a second, no, let's, no, let's, <laughs> we're, we're, Charles, Charles, we're gonna, <laughs> Charles, time out. Charles, <laughs> Charles, let's let Bakari respond. <laughs> so I, I, I hear you, but like I, I just think that it's very easy to, to say things like progressive education and pick on New York and about. It's I, hard you know, to say it. It's not easy, man. It's heartbreaking. But I'm just telling you, it should be even more heartbreaking when you go and look at the underperformance in Mississippi. When you look at the underperformance in South Carolina, when you look at the underperformance in Louisiana and Georgia, but even more tangibly, how are public schools funded in this country? It's a three-legged school, stool, right? It's local funding, it's state funding, and it's federal funding from your specific titles, etc. Right? So imagine this: imagine you're a state legislator from a poor rural district. I have a little experience with that. You you don't have any industry in your district because you have poor schools. But in turn, you also have poor schools because you don't have any industry in your district. It becomes the proverbial catch-22. So two of those three-legged stools in the way that we fund our public school system don't work. Those, that's the fundamental inequity that we're talking about. And so not only do you have schools that are under-resourced and teachers that are underpaid, but the system, governmental system that you would you razzed me on earlier, but the system then is fundamentally and inherently flawed. And that's what I'm talking about. That's the cycle of poverty that I'm talking about. That is, that is where you see individuals who are, when I say punished because of the zip code they're born into, like you, you grow up in an area that's a poor area. That's and a cop out though. I'm sorry. That's not a cop. I'm is. not talking about the, the I'm student. I'm talking about curriculum, not funding. And I'm not talking about the student. A book is a book. How about buying a tough book? If you're going to only, whatever the book is, get the tough book. The 100,000 folks who come here from India to work in Silicon Valley every year, almost all of them grow up poorer than anybody in Mississippi. Almost all of That's them grow up. That's not what I'm talking the, about, So though. it's not about them. How come those poor Indians are getting jobs in Silicon Valley? What are you talking about? You're saying it's about money. I'm saying it's not about no, money. No, I'm actually talking about the school and the school district. You're talking about a book. You're talking well, about funding. Yes, because what happens? This is, uh, let's, let's use funding this. Funding is money. Let's take this example. You take kid A and you put him in a school, a poor rural school in the South, wherever it may be, right? 
and he has the toughest books that that school can afford, right? You take school B, where they have access to the Wall Street Journal, where they have laptops that they go home with, where they have every resource that you can imagine, where they have AP, where they have international baccalaureate or whatever y'all have now, where they have all of these things plus co-curricular activities, where they have $30 million multimedia resource centers, that kid is going to have a better chance to succeed than kid A. I'm not talking about whether or not we're patting them on the butt and say run fast. I'm talking about giving these kids equity. Why does one kid not deserve an opportunity to reach their potential, but the other one does? That's my only point. Right. All right. But all I'm saying Charles, is we, that we got to move on because we have both have the same book. Now, obviously, if they have a computer center and all those things, well, that's what I'm but, talking but about. there's no reason it. But to me, it comes back, though, to curriculum. The ability to, to think that this kid can't do the work, oh, Bukhar, you're missing right. the point. Charles, that I'm is a perfect that they segue. Never give this kid the book. Charles, the this right is books. the perfect segue. I we got we got to move on because I want to get both your responses to this. Uh, and this is a perfect segue. So we have an audience question here about CRT, uh, critical race theory. So this has to do with curriculum and education. Uh, so Bakari, <laughs> taking a nap. <laughs> So, well, so it says, the question is, with CRT education, what is the message to young black people? It concerns me the negative world they are raised in. They need to know their greatness and true potential in the world, not that others take away from them. No one can take their greatness. If they can learn that, no one can take it away. What's your response to that? And then, Charles, I'd, I'd like to hear your response. That person has no idea what critical race theory is. Critical race Come theory talk to isn't, him in the uh, even, reception he, after. The critical race theory isn't even taught in K-12 through schools. I mean, let's be honest and real about this. I mean, I know we've seen all of the, it's a new fad and thing. And Critical race theory is American history. You know what's crazy? People didn't even know Black Wall Street existed until Watchmen came out on Netflix last year. You know, teaching people from whence we've come. I saw, a, I saw the last ad of, I don't know if he's a senator. What, what is Youngkin? Is he a senator now or is he? I don't want to get his... He's running for governor. I know, he's running for governor. I saw an ad from Yunkin where there was a woman who was trying to, and I know we're not for cancel culture, she was trying to cancel Beloved by Toni Morrison because her son had nightmares after reading it. Well, if you have nightmares about the black experience, how do you think black people feel? (laughs) Like, it's absurd. Like, teaching people about slavery... Teaching people about the fact that Dr. King was in Memphis, Tennessee, when he was assassinated, he wasn't talking about racial justice. You know what Dr. King was actually talking about? He was talking about wages for sanitation workers. Yeah, the Memphis strike. The Memphis strike, strike. correct. I mean, teaching people about the history of this country, and I I made a statement that I believe is, is true. I don't think anything about this country is irredeemable at all. I love this country. I'm so fortunate enough to be born and blessed in this country. But I also know that the blood of my family literally runs through the soil of this great country. So I have the ability to question her. I know people who literally died for this country. So I I believe that I have the ability to continue to mold and reimagine and push her to be her best self. Critical race theory is one of the biggest. It's 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 like it's it's an interesting concept because most of the people who are talking about it don't know what it is. Number two, Kay Ivey said, we banned critical race theory in elementary, middle, and high schools. Well, you ban something y'all don't teach. And we talk about cancel culture all the time, but you want to now cancel books. I just think it's patently absurd. Critical race theory, from, and it's, it's one of these things, obviously, that's taken on a life of its own. That's true. I think the notion, the way, the reason some parents are upset about it is that... Uh, they, that they've interpreted it to be where their kids are being taught that they themselves are bad people because of slavery, something that they weren't involved in, that all white people are bad or inherently evil or culpable for wherever the position is of, of black people. And so that's where I think the pushback is coming from. Um, I do think, obviously... And I, I just talked about it. I think our education system is horrible. Mm-hmm. And I think we should teach more history about everybody in this country, everyone who's contributed to it. Because I think if we understood each other more, we, we'd have a whole lot less problems. If we, if we knew each other's history, 
um, I think we could appreciate each other so much more, you know, um, it's, and and it's, I I think there are powerful forces though, that want to make sure we never get there. I agree. So, you know, I think if I'm a white parent and someone's telling my kid that they're, they're, that they're evil because they're white, I would be upset about that. And I would go down to the school board and raise hell. And uh, I also think that, you know, listen, the school, the books probably shouldn't say, hey, there was slavery, there was Martin Luther King, and then there was Muhammad Ali, and then there was Dr. J, right? Like, you know, shouldn't. <laughs> like, yeah, we, gotta, like we, teach, we, we teach Martin, Malcolm, and Rosa to black folk, yeah, and like, then we you, say ban critical race theory. Like, how do you ban critical race theory and give us Juneteenth and then ban teaching us while we have Juneteenth? Yeah, so that like, part, I mean, teaching American history is important. There's so many nuances to it. it so is. many, so much beautiful contribution. And by the way, struggle. You know, that's you what binds back, a lot of us. Right, binds all of us to a degree. I mean, everyone, you know, you talk to people and they tell you, when my mom got here or my granddad got here, you know, New York is a perfect place for that kind of stuff, right? You know, Ellis Island and, you know, and, and, and you know, everyone's got stories. Everyone's got struggles. Uh, and, and very few of us come from some sort of nobility that we've always had this sort of high seat looking down on our fellow Americans you know, to a degree, we've all struggled. We've all crawled. We're all standing on the shoulders of people who came before us. And I think that's a beautiful thing. If we can learn more about that, I, I think it will make us a more perfect union. That's a good answer, bro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, we're going to move to closing statements uh, and give you both the chance to, to uh, uh, give your pitch to the audience. You know, again, we're, we're focused on the question. Uh, you know, what is the be- best pathway to unlock uh, opportunities for Americans to achieve their dreams? Answer A was primarily through private sector job creation, removing unnecessary government red tape that destroys innovations. Option B, primarily through government safety net programs, protecting consumers from toxic corporations. Uh, Option C, only government programs. Option D, only private sector business or charitable groups. I just want to say thank you to everybody who came out and allowed us to engage and not scream and yell at each other that you see sometimes on on whatever news network you watch and have a good substantive debate that we're friends before we're going to be friends later and we're going to go to Maryland and do it again and just have fun. So I, I appreciate, I appreciate that environment that pushing you to do better and be more and excel. And I do think that we live in a culture of low expectation. What's worse than that, Charles, is oftentimes we get what we expect, right? And I think that our better days are ahead. I'm a firm believer that it's not what we were or what we are, but it's what we can be. I don't, I, it terrifies me when people are like, I want to go back to the good old days. And I'm like, for who exactly? Let's mm-hmm. go forward. Let's go to a place where we can all uh, uh, f- fulfill our, our greatest potential. I think the government should play a role in ensuring that people have that opportunity. I don't think government should choose who wins. But I don't like when people, because of who they love, what they look like, the color of their skin, who they're married to, who they're praying, who they pray to, are locked out of the game. That's what I fight for, to ensure that everybody can get in and get on the field and then let your God given potential determine who wins and who doesn't, let your work ethic and all of those things. But for far too long in this country, there are people who have to stand outside the gate and look over the fence. And I'm going to just tear the fence down and let everybody in and let everybody play. Well, first of all, thank you all very much. It really has been uh, wonderful. Um, do you have ice in Texas? I've been asking for ice that, water since. The uh, <laughs> they have Man, you guys, ice here. It's, it's like you don't ask for ice in Texas. That's a you, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, like, uh, okay. Puns. So anyway, I just I couldn't stop thinking about that. Damn, the water's hot. Um, so <laughs> had me thinking. Golly, maybe Picari's right. This damn water is so hot. But no, just here's the thing. I just don't think many of us appreciate how amazing America is. It is, it is, there's a reason people convert refrigerators into floating rafts and try to get here. It is the greatest country in the world. And I believe even with all of the issues that anyone right now in this country can make it. I'm not saying some have a harder path than others. Obviously, that's the truth. But I believe any person in America at this very moment can make it. First and foremost, though, that they have to believe they can make it. This involves no money. It involves nothing. It involves just 
a sort of cultural society, a way of thinking, and it has to begin in your own personal community, in your household, you can make it. Secondly, taking advantage of the things that are around you, the resources. Yeah, you know what? Go shovel some damn snow during the snowfall because you can make that extra money and maybe you can buy the laptop and then maybe you can start your online business. I believe we have everything we need inside of us and I don't think there's any better economic backdrop to make it come true. I think we're evolving and I think we should continue to evolve. Listen, I, the, I'm, I'm not the guy who thinks that every corporate CEO should make what they make. Uh, you know, I'm not the person that thinks globalism is great. I, I you know, I, I, I cringe knowing that every time people click, click their computer and they, and they buy something online that, you know, the money goes out of this country into another country. There's a thing called velocity of money. You know, we've printed up so much money over the last couple of decades. I mean, just mind boggling amounts of it. But velocity of money is when I get 10 bucks and I, give, and I buy something, uh, let's say I bought two bottles of water from Bakari and Ice, and he went to 10 bucks, and then he went to Carrie, and he bought something from her, and she went to the audience and bought something from someone else. That's velocity of money. That's how we all get to touch it. You know where velocity of money is right now? It, it's gone. It's vanished. It's disappeared. So there are things, I think, within the capitalistic system. I do with my arch strongest, most orthodox conservative friends. That's why I have my big debate with them. I, you know, I, I think a free, fair market isn't us shipping all these jobs away uh, and leaving uh, you know, despair in its, in its wake. But as far as being in this country right now at this time, it's, a, it's the most amazing place to be. I think anyone can make it. I think we all can make it better. But I think we have to have limited government so that the individual the individual can go out there and claim it, to go out there and get it. It's there for the taking. It is there for all of us. But you have to apply yourself, and it begins with believing, hey, first and foremost, you can do it. And then if you've got those tools, intellectual, heart, spirit, this is the best place to apply it. Ask all the people that try to get in here every single day. All right. Charles, Bakari, it's been a pleasure. All right, thanks. Please join me in giving them a thank you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, man. That water break is hitting me. <laughs> All right, let's quickly summarize our uh, debate, post debate poll compared to the pre debate poll. We started on the top line primarily at the beginning with 66%. If you look, much of that has moved down to from primarily private sector job creation to only private sector business, religious, and charity. D was 11% in the pre-poll. It's now 27%. The top went from 66 to 56%. So I would say we have seen a shift from uh, saying primarily through private sector job creation to only private sector religious and private charity groups. So I would say the position of going favoring private sector over government programs seems to have won tonight. Uh, so good job, Charles, Bakari, Kerry. Thank you very much. We hope you'll watch again tomorrow night. Uh, you can go to steamboatinstitute.org. Please support our programs. We need your financial support as well as following us on social media. Thanks again for taking time to attend and to watch online. Have a good evening and be sure to watch this on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel later as well. Good evening.